To all who are new here, my name is Dr. Michelle Henney, and I'd like to welcome you to Releve Sports Medicine's Virtual Journal Club. For additional webinar educational opportunities, you can visit our website and register directly for the webinar or sign up for the email list to be notified of upcoming webinars. We are continuing to update our schedule, so check back often. The information contained in this video content represent the views and opinions of the creators of the video content and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Releve Sports Medicine. The mere appearance of video content on the website does not constitute an endorsement by Releve Sports Medicine or its affiliates of such video content. The video content has been made available for informational educational purposes only. Releve Sports Medicine does not make any representation or warranties with respect to the accuracy, applicability, and fitness or completeness of the video content. Releve Sports Medicine does not warrant the performance, effectiveness, or applicability of any sites listed or linked to, to in any video content. The video content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it out because of something you have read or seen on the website. Releve Sports Medicine hereby disclaims any and all liability to any party for any direct, indirect, implied, punitive, special, incidental, or other consequential damages arising directly or indirectly from any use of the video content, which is provided as is and without warranties. We are looking for an athletic trainer to join our team. This is a combined position working in a sports medicine clinic and at an NAIA university. Please feel free to pass our information along if you know of a qualified candidate. More information regarding applying can be found on our website. For all athletic trainers who are intending to get live CEUs from the VOC, you will receive an email one hour after the webinar concludes, which includes a link to the combined quiz evaluation and assessment. You will have up to 72 hours to complete the quiz and the evaluation. This email will come from customercare at gotowebinar.com. Please ensure that this is done to receive your statement of credit. If you don't receive a follow-up email or you have any other concerns, then contact us via our email at journalclub at relevesportsmedicine.com. Once the statement of credit is available for download from our website, you will receive an email notification. If you have not received your email notification, you can always check back on the website and determine whether your uh, statement of credit is available for download. If you have any questions during the webinar, please submit the question and we will review the questions at the conclusion of the presentation. If you cannot see the PowerPoint slides and you're accessing the webinar from your mobile phone, swipe the screen to the left and to the right, to the left or to the right, and the slides will become visible. The recording will be available for review from our website tomorrow. Our speaker this evening is Dr. John Nidecker. Dr. Nidecker is a primary care sports medicine physician who practices in Raleigh, North Carolina. He specializes in treating orthopedic injuries and sports-related concussion. He's one of the team physicians with the Carolina Mudcats, the minor league team for the Milwaukee Brewers. He is also an assistant professor at Campbell University School of Osteopathic Medicine. He is an active ringside physician covering combat sports events in both North Carolina and New York. He has been on the Association of Ringside Physicians Board of Directors for over 10 years and was recently elected the president of the Association of Ringside Physicians. And he will be speaking with us tonight. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope everyone is doing. Uh, Dr. Henny, thank you for inviting me to, to speak tonight. And uh, if if anything, any technical difficulties happen, just please let me know if something happens where you can't hear me or anything like that. So <laughs> um, I guess the first thing I would like to do is uh, just tell you how I got into this whole thing, because I think that's an interesting story in the sense that, you know, we, you know, this is not something that, you know, athletic trainers are necessarily exposed to. Um, and uh Neither are, it's, it's really not a, a sports medicine exposure thing too in the traditional sense. So it's something you have to really seek out. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll just tell you the story of how I got into this. So um, I'm born and raised in, in New York and my father 
uh, was a big boxing fan and would always take me to fights at Madison Square Garden. So as a young child, I, I had a, a, a love for boxing at an early age. Um, in my uh, in, in my sporting, my athletic endeavors, I, I really became a wrestler. And, you know, the, the affinity for mixed martial arts really, you know, gravitated towards me because there's a lot of wrestling that's mixed into it. So, um, so, so when I saw the UFC, it's like that, that, that's something I understand. And I, I, I would, you know, I, I really like the sport. I, I would like to do it. So in medical school, uh, the goal was always to do sports medicine, um, you know, in the traditional sense of covering the sports that we, we do on a regular basis in high school. And, and, uh, uh, one one night, uh, I was at a uh, at a bar with my friends, and we were watching a UFC fight. This was a long time ago. This is when Chuck Liddell was relevant. Uh, he, I think he was fighting Rampage Jackson that night. And I said, you know, what? that would be a cool sport to cover. But I had no idea how I could even find the avenue of doing that. So I actually reached out to a to a combat sports journalist with with. Kevin Iole, who is still writing about combat sports to this day, and he actually answered me. And I went to medical school in New Jersey, and the contact of the New Jersey Athletic uh, Commission, and I cold called them and I said, "I'd like to cover sport. I cover sports. I'm a medical student. I want to do sports medicine." And basically, I got hung up on because uh, they said, "You're not a doctor," and I said, "Not yet, but I will be." And they said, "Well, call us when you're a doctor." So. I kept at it for for a couple of years into into medical school. I kept on pestering the athletic commission and um, into residency when I did become a doctor. And one day I, I got a call out of the blue and the uh, the head ringside for Jersey call and said, "Who are you? And you why are you why are you bothering the commission?" So I told him who I was and kind of the story of of why I wanted to do it. And he said, "Well, I have a fight in Atlantic City this weekend. How about you come down and and learn what this is all about?" Uh, so Dr. Coletta took me under his wing and taught me everything, uh, as a, as a resident and had it ever since. Uh, the one thing about Dr. Coletta was he was also the chairman of the association of ringside physicians. So he got me in with the organization that we'll be talking about, uh, throughout our presentation here. So without further ado, now, you know, my background and how I got into this, uh, but, um, we'll, uh, We'll tell you. We'll we'll go through the things that I I will be speaking about tonight. Um, so overview of tonight. Uh, we're a little bit about boxing versus mixed martial arts. Some of you may be very familiar with combat sports. Some of you may not. Um, we'll go through the fighter license because that can be different depending on where you are. Uh, typical event coverage, uh, medical suspensions after bouts, which is interesting because that's not do a normal uh, normal non-combat sports common injuries that we see uh, and how athletic trainers could potentially get involved in this. Um, I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose. I am the president of the Association of Ringside Physicians, so I do have an allegiance there. Uh, just so you guys know, the Association of Ringside Physicians is an international nonprofit organization that's basically devoted to uh, educating and uh, you know, promoting health and safety with all those who are involved in combat sports. So before we start, I just want you to realize that combat sports is different than non-combat sports in the sense that this is the hurt game. Objects of the the object the object of these sports is different than all others. We're not trying to score a touchdown or hit a home run or score a goal. The the goal is to uh, to dominate your opponent in some ways. Some say some say it's to cause a concussion. That's not necessarily the case, but uh, you know, there is, there is bodily harm that you inflict on your opponent and it's on purpose. So guidelines that we generally use in traditional sports medicine may not apply here because of that. And the other thing is there's few qualities out there. So a lot of ringside medicine is based on what we can take from uh, our non-combat sports and apply, but we also need to use the, the collective expertise of, of uh, those who have been doing this for a while. So um, I'll ask a rhetorical poll, uh, you, know, uh, you know, just, you know, some of you have probably not covered 
uh, any box martial arts. But in general, of what you know about these sports, which one do you think is safer, boxing or MMA? And I'll get to maybe the answer to that uh, in a little bit. Uh, I will say this, though. Box martial arts are similar sports and objective, but they are different. Trying to compare these two sports is compare hockey and lacrosse. Uh, so there are some, some similarities, uh, but there are a lot of differences as well. A um, little bit of boxing history. Uh, there's been some form of boxing around since 300 BC. Boxing rules have been around since the 1860s. This is when rounds were instituted and gloves uh, were instituted and the 10 count after are not instituted. Interestingly, in uh, in the old the old boxing rules uh, before the, the the rules that we all know, uh, there there were rounds, but a round was over when a when a box was knocked down to the ground. Um, the round the next round would start when that guy guy that guy got up and wanted to continue the fight. If he didn't want to continue the fight, the fight was then over. Um, so there wasn't any timed rounds. Uh, the other thing too, it was bare knuckle at the time. Um, so there was, you know, there was no gloves and, and there was no 10 count because it was more or less if you got up and wanted to continue to fight, the, the, the fight would continue. Interestingly, these actually were really long and there, people found them actually boring. So they decided to change these rules to make things more exciting. So gloves were instituted so guys wouldn't hurt their hands and they could hit harder. And, uh, and then the, the rounds and, and the 10 count uh, started after that. Now, MMA is a little different. MMA is a much newer sport. Uh, the U UFC 1 was held in 1993, and the purpose of the UFC was to determine which martial art fighting style was the most dominant. And they marketed it as uh, there are no rules. Um, but in the late 1990s, uh, the UFC came under fire. Uh, uh, it became a, a lightning rod and, and some politicians, uh, the most outspoken one, uh, Senator John McCain, came out against it and called it human cockfighting. Uh, sponsors started to not touch it and some states started to ban it. Um, in, uh, in the early 2000s, the UFC was about to go under and Dana White and his uh, high school buddies, the Fertitta brothers, uh, who uh, owned some casinos in Las Vegas, uh, decided to buy this for dollars uh, in 2001. Uh, the interesting thing is recently sold 50, about 51% of the company a couple of years ago, I think it was in uh, two or three years ago, uh, and they sold it for $4 billion. So quite a nice uh, return on them with still a stake in the company, uh, they still own 49% of it. Um, the, they also ran towards regulation. Uh, they ran decisions, they asked them, how can we regulate this sport to make it safer and more palatable? So that's when weight classes started and uh, more of the units um, that are the, the basis of how MMA is conducted uh, were started uh, in those early 2000s. And the most fight that really took the UFC off the map um, you know, to the to the public was uh, Forrest Griffin versus Stefan Bonner, and that was the finals of the, the Ultimate Fighter, which was basically a reality show that the UFC created, um, where these guys lived in a house and then ended up fighting a tournament style to get a UFC contract. The fight was very exciting, and it was on it was on uh, cable TV, so it wasn't beyond a pay a paywall, so it really took off. Uh, professional boxing. Uh, Matches are anywhere from four to ten rounds, and they're three-minute rounds. You'll get a one-minute rest in between. Gloves are eight to ten ounces, uh, with welterweight being the weight in which uh, the glove size goes up. So above welterweight, um, welterweight, they start using ten-ounce gloves. Below that, they use eight-ounce gloves. Um, MMA, professional MMA, is three to five rounds, and they're five-minute rounds, and they'll also get one-minute rest in between. And the gloves are four ounces, and they're based on um, they're, they're based the gloves ounces are based on the actual hand size, uh, and uh, you can see that fingers are exposed. So with a boxing glove, um, you may you're going to see more eye injuries uh, with MMA than boxing.
Uh, ways to win, boxing, you can win by knockout, technical knockout, or decision. MMA, you can win by knockout, technical knockout, decision, or decision. So there's more ways to, to win in MMA. Boxing, you have 10 seconds to get up. And if you don't, if you do, then the fight can, uh, uh, usually in most, uh, in most uh, professional boxing matches, however, if you're knocked down three times in a round, the fight is stopped uh, or the uh, referee can stop it if they feel uh, things are, are getting overwhelming for somebody. Uh, in MMA, if a fighter's knocked down, uh, the opponent can continue to, to attack uh, until uh, the fighter, you know, if the fighter starts showing they're not intelligently defending themselves, then the bout is over. If they're able to basically collect themselves, uh, the fight can continue. Intelligently themselves is, you know, it means that they're working for position and deflecting uh, strikes and controlling their opponent's uh, arms or, and trying to block things, not just you know covering up and letting the guy uh, wail on them. So um, if uh, ha MMA, if the downed a fighter appears to be unconscious, the referee is gonna stop the fight immediately. Uh, boxing, only punching is loud. MMA, punching, kicking, elbows, knees, which uh, the elbows and knees are cuts. Uh, and you can, you can strike both standing and on the ground. Grappling with boxing or the tie-up usually happens when fighters are fatigued or trying to defend themselves. Uh, the referee usually breaks it up after a couple of seconds, where in MMA, uh, you can grapple the entire match, uh, and you can strike from that, that clinch, or you can attempt to take your, your opponent down. Uh, grappling also happens on the ground, and uh, fighters will uh, attempt to push a more dominant position or try and submit. Uh, there are events with various uh, hold, you know, arm bars or chokes or, or different uh, submission maneuvers. If no action is happening, though, the referee will stand the fighters back up to the standing position. Couple rules, you, you, you cannot kick a, uh, or knee to the head to a downed opponent, and the downed opponent is having at least one knee or, or hand on the ground. All right, so I'll ask it again. Which sport do you think is safer, boxing or MMA? Well, if you answered one, you're both. Uh, MMA is certainly more dangerous from an orthopedic perspective and lacerations, but boxing is probably more dangerous from from a neurological and brain injury perspective, acutely and and probably chronically. So. I, I feel like I can say that uh, with with not complete certainty, but uh, good uh, uh, good thoughts with based uh, based on some of the limited data that we have. Um, there was a study that looked at 152 UFC bouts uh, that happened in Nevada in 2007 through 2009. Uh, 60 percent had no complaints or injuries post bout. 19 percent of the fighters had significant facial lacerations or soft tissue injuries. Six percent of the fighters had an orthopedic injury. Three percent of the fighters had a nasal fracture. And 12% of the fighters were sent for a head CT. Uh, none of them had any intracranial pathology. Uh, so no brain bleeds or subdural hematomas or any. Uh, this study that was done in, in 2010 by Baird looked at mortalities in professional boxing from 1950 to 2007. Uh, there were 339 deaths during that time period. Uh, uh, it's nice to see that over, over a...
Can you hear me now? You lost me? Yes, yes. Oh, perfect. Oh, yes. Sorry about that. All right. Where were we? <laughs> here. We were here? Okay. All right. So so just to go back, uh, so we did, you, you heard me uh, speak about the injuries seen in MMA. You saw that part? Yes. Yeah, you had just finished yes. talking about the PTs. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So yeah. So we this study looked at uh, deaths uh, between 1950 and 2007, um, and uh, and 339 deaths happened. They looked at these two time periods because this was the when championship fights went from 15 rounds to 12 uh, rounds. So they wanted this a difference uh, in that time period, and but authors determined was that it wasn't necessarily due to more rounds. It was due to probably shorter career or fights and stricter regulations and better medicine. Um, interestingly, 80% of the fatalities involved knockouts and technical knockouts, and 70% of uh, the knockout fatalities happened in rounds. Um, something that you guys are being privy to that uh, is actually a head of publication but has been accepted is we did a study uh, in basically looking at uh, deaths from 2019 to see if there's been any improvement uh, in this and also to look at look for other trends and possibilities. Uh, but we found very similar uh, uh, findings to that, that Baird study. We had 84 total fatalities in professional uh, boxing uh, over the past 20 years. There was a higher incidence with knockouts and technical knockouts. Uh, there was a higher incidence in the lighter weight classes and bouts that went deep into uh, into the in the later rounds. Um, now in MMA, uh, since 1998, uh, there's been 19 deaths involving MMA athletes. Uh, this is not just neurologic deaths, uh, but also like cardiac deaths, um, weight cutting deaths, uh, and uh, eight. Eight, eight of the deaths were brain related, but only three of these uh, deaths were actually with regulated professional bouts. There's a lot of unsanctioned things that happen around the country. Um, and uh, those those are, if you want to make an apples to, uh, app, well, apples to oranges comparison, because again, it's boxing and MMA. But if we're looking at deaths, uh, if we're taking pro boxing deaths that are sanctioned, there was 84 deaths uh, in a similar time period compared to three. Um, Hutchison uh, looked at 84, 844 bouts in, from the UFC uh, over a six-year time period, and he thought that there was a 12% knockout rate uh, and a 19% TKO rate due to strikes. 20% of the bouts ended submission, and 44% ended in a decision. Um, other literature states that uh, knockout rates in boxing, professional boxing is about 5%. So in this study as well, they found that uh, the average time between a knockout and how many strikes before stopped uh, um, the, the, in three, three and a half seconds after uh, the knockout happened before it was stopped, 2.6 additional strikes were landed to the loser. Uh, for TKOs, uh, a 30 second interval immediately preceding the stoppage, the loser received an average of 18 strikes, 92% uh, of those being head strikes. So if you wanna look at boxing and MMA from a neurological standpoint, uh, boxing at 84 deaths over 20 years, that's 4.2 deaths per year. And MMA, uh, pro MMA had three deaths over 20 th 23 years. So that's uh, significantly, I didn't do the statistics to get you a p-value, but um, you know, certainly there's, there's less deaths per year um, due to brain injury and professional regulated boxing and uh, uh, mixed martial arts. So, in summary, death rates in boxing are higher. Death rates in boxing are usually associated with KO and TKOs, but KOs and TKOs rates are higher in MMA. So what is the difference? Um, you know, boxing KOs and TKOs are usually associated with more cumulative head trauma. So in other words, it's probably not the big shot that kills you. It's all this. It's all the. It's all the paper paper cuts and it's cumulative trauma over time that is the more. Uh, uh, that puts you more at risk for brain damage, both acutely and probably chronically. Um, the other aspect, if you look at the chronic aspect, MMA guys need to uh, to look at 
they need to train in other areas other than uh, than striking. So they tend to not spar as much just because their their sport um, needs them to focus on some type of grappling in their training camps. So they have as much head trauma in their camps as they do in general with boxers. Now things are changing. I think some guys are are sparring less and they're they're not taking some uh, um, some of the things of how uh, how how football is going where we're doing less hitting, but you know, you can't, you can't box with, and you can't, and you can't do MMA without doing some type of sparring. You have to, you have to train like you're going to compete. So you can't completely. Um, since MMA is such a young.
All right, I guess we're good again. I'm, I apologize. I moved to a different area of my house, so um, hopefully we're good now. Well, we can certainly hear you, so yes. Okay. So. All right. So, all right. I'll, I'll, uh, I feel like I know where I dropped out. So I think I'm good from here. All right. Um, hopefully we have no more technical dif difficulties here, uh, from yeah. here on out. So anyway, so we we're at, all right. So the Cleveland clinics, uh, Lou Rova center is, uh, they're doing the professional fighters brain health study. Uh, there's over 400 fighters registered and basically what they're doing is, looking uh, at MRIs over time with fighters. They're basically getting an MRI every year and they're looking at the different changes that they're seeing on, on their brains. Um, preliminary data is, is basically showing that the more fighters, the more bouts that somebody's had in their career, the more, uh, more at risk they are for changes. Now, what does that mean as far as uh, cognitive and, and problems and things like CTE? That's yet to be determined, but they are seeing more changes in the brain with more exposure. Um, so, um, all right. So uh, now let's get into the differences uh, that's 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 going on with combat sports around the country. So, the United States uh, has these sports governing bodies uh, for our amateur sports. We're all familiar with this. On um, you know, if you're if you're involved uh, with other things, most of the time you see this with, is on the Olympic level. So you have probably heard about USA Ski and USA uh, Wrestling and USA uh, um, you know, Taekwondo and USA Swimming. Well, there is US, USA Boxing. Um, so USA Boxing is basically the regulator of all amateur sports within the United States, uh, all amateur boxing within the United States. Uh, the International Kickboxing Federation um, basically regulates amateur kickboxing uh, as well. There's the I, um, IMMAF, which is uh, an organization that helps reg um, regulate and establish rules for amateur MMA. Um, but we also have uh, commissions in our in our country, and those are the various different state commissions. Uh, that are around the country, as well as the uh, tribal commissions for the uh, different uh, reservation um, tribal lands that are that also put on uh, combat sports events. Um, some commissions choose to regulate some amateur stuff as well. So um, I can give you an example. I cover fights in both North Carolina and New York. Uh, amateur kickboxing and mixed martial arts is regulated by North Carolina's commission, as well as professional boxing um, and professional MMA and professional kickboxing. New York does not regulate amateur kickboxing and amateur MMA. They are only involved with professional uh, boxing kick. Actually, they don't even, they don't even regulate uh, professional kickboxing. Uh, they only regulate professional boxing and, uh, and professional MMA. Uh, fighters um, uh, have to apply for a federal ID card. Now, this is just a general information uh, um, piece in the sense that they list who their manager, promoter, and trainer information is. And this is for more of a database uh, that the commissions use um, uh, to track fighters on, on uh, medical suspensions. Um, but for every state that a fighter fights in, they actually have to apply for a separate license um, in each each state that they're uh, planning to fight in. And not all state athletic commissions uh, function equally. Um, I've had the privilege, or I guess maybe uh, the experience um, in, in being able to cover fights um, in four different states, New Jersey, uh, Ohio, um, New York and North Carolina, and the way things operate in all four are vastly different. Um, to get a license, there are some universal requirements that pretty much every state requires, but then there is some other uh, requirements that go above and beyond that some states do require um, in addition to these universal requirements. Uh, most states require an annual physical exam, an annual dilated eye exam, 
Uh, and just to show you what are we looking for uh, to see, to make sure that, that these guys' uh, vision is, is well enough for them to fight. There are no set guidelines actually out there, and it's up to the discretion of the different states to um, to accept uh, a, an exam as as they're fit to fight or or they actually want to see things. Uh, the Association of Ringside Physicians has created a position statement on ocular guidelines, um, and uh, these are all available on our website. Um, fighters should have uncorrected visual acuity of 20. 200 or better in each eye, uh, a corrected a corrected visual acuity of 20, uh, 60 in each eye, absence of major ocular disease, glaucoma, macular disease, or retinal disease, and fighters with only one functioning eye should not be allowed to fight. Uh, there is some guidelines regarding ocular surgery. Um, any any intraocular surgery history, uh, cataracts, retinal detachment should be dealt with on a case by case basis, and refractive surgery. Uh, those who've had LASIK or PRK are allowed to compete, but with radial keratotomy uh, should not be allowed to uh, compete because uh, radial keratotomy is more associated with a higher risk of globe rupture uh, due to the incision that is made. Um, there is also for universal requirements is um, blood testing every six months, testing for hepatitis B and C as well as HIV. Uh, the ARP recommends that testing be done every six months uh, with HIV uh, 1 and 2 serum antibodies uh, done, as well as hepatitis B surface antigen, hepatitis C antibodies as well. Uh, now, with hepatitis C, it can be uh, treated and in some cases cured with medication nowadays. Uh, so we do have guidelines uh, that, that we recommend that commissions may want to use to allow somebody um, who's had hepatitis C in the past to be allowed to compete um if if they've been treated uh with these protocols so um now there's like i was saying there was some some state specific requirements that go above and beyond those uh minimal universal requirements uh some states require brain imaging before licensure ct or mri um, some states require baseline uh no matter what and some want uh some uh, neuroimaging that's done every three years. Other states only require if they're, you know, of a certain age or older. Uh, they have an extensive losing record or have had a lot of losses in a row. Um, cardiac testing, some states require baseline EKG no matter what, and other states require EKG only if uh, they're of a certain age or older. Um, some states even require perfusion uh, testing uh, um, as well uh, for certain ages. Some states require a blood test uh, in addition to the um, hepatitis and HIV. Uh, the Association of Ringside Physicians is currently uh, in development of a position statement on medical clearance of the older fighter. Um, this is becoming uh, more common uh, uh, nowadays, uh, and, and you, you're probably aware of this if you do follow combat sports. Um, it's become increasingly more common uh, for older fighters lately um, than before. Uh, some states uh, require um, pregnancy testing uh, um, for for our female fighters. Uh, some interestingly, some states do not. Uh, so uh, some states also require uh, full gynecological exams as well for the female fighters as well. Um, so there's a, there's something some states require just a urine pregnancy test the, the night of the fight or the day before, um, and some want serum testing within the last 30 days. Uh, fighters uh, um, typically do not have it's it's crazy how how many fighters do not have medical uh, insurance while training, uh, but when a fighter does fight for a promotion, uh, for about the the uh, the promotion is required to um, cover them for that night for any injury sustained. Um, so yeah, so we have, not only do we have the fighters, not only do we have their, their corner and their trainers, but we also have uh, the commissions and, and, and various sanctioned bodies, but we also have the promoters. And these are the guys that, that put the fights on, who make the matches, who sign the athletes to their promotion. Um, and there's, the large ones that we all know, such as the UFC uh, and Top Rank and boxing and 
and Bellator, but there's lots of lower level promotions all around the country uh, that that basically, if you, if you want to think of it in in to that are similar to the uh, to our non-combat sports are almost like the minor leagues, if you will. So those who make it uh, on those smaller stages start to go up the ladder and get to these bigger promotions um, as they create a name for themselves. Um, the commissions, uh, the various commissions, their purpose is to regulate combat sports for the protection of the public and to ensure the health and safety of their of the combatants fighting. Um, however, I will say the uh, the commissions, there is a lot of uh, politics. Often commissions are appointed by, the commission members are often appointed by uh, state politicians. So there is, there is that that is involved. Um, I can give you an example of how political this can be. In, uh, you know, New York State was one of the last states to sanction MMA um, uh, in, the, in the country, um, and it finally became legal in 2016. The reason why this was held up wasn't really because of the question of whether or not MMA was safe, uh, or relatively safe or not. It was more related to the state polit some state politicians, uh, elected officials in the New York Congress who had relationships with uh, basically casino uh, union uh, uh, workers and um, and uh, the Fertitta uh, brothers who owned the UFC uh, did not use union uh, workers in their casinos. So basically it was more held up for, for that reason than anything else. Uh, as elections changed and people came out of office, uh, finally this was able to move forward in 2016. Um, the, the commissions are also under pressure from the state as well because these events do make, make some money. Uh, you can imagine what a a big time uh, event brings to an area as far as revenue is concerned with hotels and, and travel and food uh, around around the venue. Um, so what, what happens on a typical fight night for me? I arrive about two hours before the event. Uh, I do a physical exam on each fighter and interesting on every referee before the event. Uh, and this is more to establish relationships and normals with each fighter and to look for uh, any red flags. Uh, we're checking their heart rate, their blood pressure, making, you know, establishing normals about their face to, you know, see if they do have a crooked nose before the fight started that night, uh, just to establish more or less baselines. And, and we're looking at other things of their eyes and a heart lung exam and uh, a basic orthopedic exam. Uh, this is usually very abridged in the sense that these fighters often, you know, they, they do have a physical exam uh, that is that's more thorough required uh, before they get their license. Um, typical event coverage is dependent on whether or not there is one or multiple physicians covering, um, and this is dependent on the different states. Um, I will tell you in New York when I cover an event, granted there are usually larger events, um, I am one of five to six ringside physicians covering at that event that night. Uh, in smaller uh, commissions, um, when I was in, you know, in, in Ohio and North Carolina, there were some times when I was the only guy covering an entire event for a night. Um, you do have to come up with an emergency um, action plan. Venues are way different uh, depending. Not every venue is uh, an arena. Uh, sometimes they're bars, uh, sometimes they're nightclubs, and uh, you know the, the terrain and, and the doors in or out are, um, can be different. So you have to have a plan and you have to coordinate uh, with EMS on the nearest hospital uh, one thing that is required pretty much universally among all uh, commissions is that EMS needs to be on site uh, um, when a combat sport event is going on. Uh, so you do meet with the uh, EMS team and, and go over the plan with them. Um, and uh, if uh, the, the ambulance leaves, uh, the event should be stopped until another uh, regabot arrives. Um, during the event, I'm sitting ring, ringside, I'm observing, I'm watching the fighters to see if they're defending themselves, I'm seeing if there's any style changes that indicate they may be hurt. Um, you need to be ready to be called in at all times and you need to know the situation. Uh, interestingly, like no fight can start unless the doctor is ringside. So if I'm working one of these smaller uh, events and I'm in the back checking out a fighter, they can't start the next fight until I come back outside ringside. Having said that, when we have these multiple 
uh, when we have these larger events, when there's multiple docs covering, you know, it's okay if I'm in the back um, looking at somebody because we have another ringside position that's there um, attending the event to work the next fight uh, on the card. Um, it's very important to get to know your referees. Uh, Big John McCarthy uh, is a is a is a good friend of the Association of Ringside Physicians, and he has a quote that I think is is very true. The worst nightmare for a, a ref is a bad ringside position, and that goes vice versa. The worst uh, nightmare for a ringside position is a bad referee. Our job is 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 similar in the sense that we are there to protect the fighters. Um, so in, you need to work in harmony uh, with your referee. They need to know uh, how you work and, and you need to, you know, create a team, uh, just how, you know, medical uh, teams and your non-combat sports uh, work together as well. Um, after the event and the fights are over, uh, every, um, every fighter does get a post-fight exam, winners and losers. Um, you know, sometimes sometimes these uh, exams are very abridged, especially if uh, the winner um, uh, won in dominant fashion. And sometimes you need to make sure that you know the the winner's hands are are okay. Um, but we're looking at their mental status, uh, neuro exam, um, ocular exam, orthopedic exam, and you're addressing any complaints. Uh, there are mandatory minimum suspensions that uh, most state commissions. Uh, um, go by. Uh, now these are minimum suspensions, uh, and you know, as the ring, covering ring type position, you can sometimes increase these suspensions. But typically, it's 30 days for a technical knockout, 60 days for a knockout, um, and submissions. Uh, some states, if you get submitted less in less than a minute, they'll ever suspend you for 30 days. Um, you know, we can also not just suspend for a time period, but we can also suspend indefinitely until they're cleared by the various. Uh, um, subspecialty that we feel they need. So if there is a knee injury, you know, we can suspend until cleared by orthopedics. Um, some uh, some states allow for the ringside physician to in issue a medical suspension to a fighter if they've been taken, if they've taken excessive head trauma. So if they've been in a war, uh, say, um, even if they're, if they're not having any complaints and have a normal post-fight exam, and even if they even won the fight, we can, we can, uh, we can suspend, um, just to give them a break. Um, common injuries we see, we see fractures, we see dislocations, um, we see certainly lacerations. Uh, if, uh, now when it comes to lacerations, you know, our, our decision to stop about is based on a, a number of factors. Um, you can see Brock Lesnar here. Uh, he does have a laceration in this one fight that's above the eye that seems to be fairly superficial. And this more deeper gash uh, below the eye on the on the right side of the screen there. Uh, truth be told, I'm more concerned about the one that's above the eye because the blood could potentially run down and obscure his vision. So, you know, lacerations are decisions on whether a fight can go on is is significantly based on location. Um, what we look for is can the fighter see? Uh, is there excessive blood loss? And is there um, potential for vital areas to be uh, injured neurovascularly. Uh, here's a um, beautiful uh, resource that um, Dr. Larry Lovelace, who's the former president of the Association of Ringside Physicians, came up with um, about how to manage cuts and, and make decisions on things. And, you know, the, uh, the, the different zones there are, are here. Um, the uh, that zone one area that's the area of the tarsal plate. So if a, a cut goes into that lacrimal sac, um, you know we definitely get concerned about that because that could affect uh, how the eye uh, lubricates itself with uh, with tears and can cause potential significant problems to the eye if uh, if significantly damaged. Other areas are more concerned about depth and location and whether or not um, the if there's blood running down could uh, obscure the vision. Um, repairing these lacerations, uh, sometimes we do it on site and sometimes we send to the hospital. This is based, these decisions are based on size, location, if you're available to do it. Um, you know, if I'm, if somebody gets cut significantly in one of the first bouts of the, of the night, I'm not going to be able to, to suture that, um, until, uh, you know, until we've had a break or, or until the end of the night. 
Um, certainly some lacerations could be more significant than others that need uh, closure of, you know, levels of being deep um, and, uh, um, and need multiple uh, areas of repair. Um, and then uh, some commission guidelines are, are there as well. Um, in New York, we're not allowed, as a, as a ringside position for New York State, I'm not allowed to repair any uh, laceration on site. Interestingly, uh, promoters actually sometimes hire their own doctor for the night to repair uh, lacerations. Uh, that certainly happens on the UFC level and, and your higher level boxing. Um, eye trauma, you can see. Uh, here you have a, a large uh, hematoma on the right side, but that's not the, the problem. What was more a problem is here in the left eye um, and the potential damage that could be there. Um, this is a, a picture of, of a ciliary body rupture or an iris rupture. Um, this is probably one of the more significant ocular injuries I've seen in the ring. Um, but any loss in vision or, or movement during uh, or after the fight, you know, these fighters need to go to the ER and get a full eye exam under slit lamp uh, to make sure there's no significant uh, trauma that needs emergent uh, treatment. Knockouts, uh, you know, it's, it is, in this sense, it is similar to what, uh, what we have normal training in. Uh, you need to monitor uh, the ABCs and, and, uh, Look at the eyes to make sure a, a pupil isn't blown that indicates that there might be some type of intracranial hemorrhage uh, you always have to assume that the neck is injured um, some sometimes uh, fighters can injure the neck on the way down um, because they're unconscious uh, before they hit the ground and this is actually an, an unfortunate uh, ha uh, recent happening and with one of the bare knuckle promotions uh, there was a cervical spine injury and it was due to the fact that the fighter was knocked out and he landed on his head uh, directly causing an axial load on, on to the spine and, and he died from his cervical spine injury from hitting the ground not from the impact of the punch. Um, you need to administer oxygen if you're thinking that there's a potential TBI uh, and you need to be patient. You know, these guys usually do wake up, but those seconds can feel like hours sometimes. Um, after a knockout, post-fight management, when they do uh, uh, regain consciousness, you're checking mental status, you're, look, you're doing your full neuro exam. Um, you know, long periods of loss of consciousness uh, typically get sent to the ER. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're uh, following these things for concussions as well. Um, the Association of Marine Club Physicians uh, did have a publication in the British Journal of Sports Medicine on concussion management in combat sports um, and how we can maybe come in line with our non-combat sports and creating more protocols. Uh, you know, before this statement was written, uh, basically a lot of the guidelines for concussion and knockouts and technical knockouts uh, were more based on, you know, what happened in the fight, you know, 30 days for a TKO, 60 days for a KO. Um, we, uh, we kept some of these guidelines, but we also are recommending requirement of uh, clearance by uh, a healthcare provider of, that's, you know, tr trained in concussion management uh, before letting them return to contact. We've uh, advocated for a return uh, to um, sport uh, progression similar to non-combat sports, but there's actually more phases with this in the sense that you not just have to uh, get back to combat, uh, um, get back to training, but also back to uh, sparring uh, as well. So there's an added uh, element to that. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there are, like I said, there are some things that we take from non-combat sports and we apply them to combat sports, but considering you know, the stakes are higher and the object is 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 uh, much more different in combat sports. You know, we need to be held to a higher, higher standard, in my opinion. The thing is, with this consensus statement, um, you know, it's up to the state commissions to adopt it um, and ringside positions who cover to adopt it as well. Um, I will tell you that this is not always being followed, although it's been publicized in a well-respected journal. Um, so the I will say this, uh, a little take on point, fighters do not complain. Um, if a fighter is complaining about a concu concussion symptoms after about 
that actually concerns me. Uh, these guys do not tell you that things are wrong. Um, and, and in fact, a lot of this is a, a sport, I, these sports are, I believe, self-selecting in the sense that these guys uh, are able to do this because they're able to minimize concussion symptoms. Um, so, so if a fighter is complaining after a fight, that that does concern me, and and I typically send those. You know, we'll monitor them, and if things resolve, that's one thing. Uh, but if they continue to have symptoms or symptoms are getting worse, we send them right to the hospital. Um, so I'll I'll include this. Uh, this is this will be my conclusion, um, and how athletic trainers uh, can be involved. As you as you can see, uh, you know, I'm not just a physician. You know, before medical school, I uh, did get my undergrad degree in athletic training, and I still maintain my certification. In fact, I submitted my uh, NATA VOC uh, credits today. Um, but uh, you don't get in this for the money, money, that's for sure. As a ringside physician, we don't make too much. Um, and as an athletic trainer, you're not going to make too much as, as well. So if you're going to get involved in this, you need to have a true passion uh, for these sports. Um, so. You know, there's some known areas uh, that we see uh, athletic trainers involved. Um, I actually do know a, a cut man for uh, LFA, David Maldonado. Um, he is uh, he is a certified athletic trainer um, as well as a physical therapist. Um, actually, lots of cut men do have some type of uh, medical background. Most of them are EMTs, uh, and then some have none. Um, some are more or less uh, operating uh, based on you know bro science and how we how how they were taught by somebody who was taught by somebody who was taught um so there's some guys who know what they're doing and there's some guys who don't uh i would think athletic trainers would be much more qualified uh than others um so if it's something that you may be interested in i would seek out uh lower level promoters in your area um and uh and you, you might gain some traction there. Um, uh, sometimes uh, they can be used in the role of physician extensors. So uh, like I said, in New York, I'm usually one of six uh, doctors covering an event, but in North Carolina, I'm, I, I can be the only fighter. So I tend to bring athletic trainers with me uh, to my events. Uh, this was actually uh, before the pandemic um, in our, our UFC event here in Raleigh. Um, and uh, there are three athletic trainers in this picture, my, my medical assistant and another ringside physician. Um, uh, they helped out with our pre-fight exam and our, and our, and our physicals. Uh, and on fight night, uh, you know, uh, we, we can use athletic trainers to basically uh, help things go smoothly, um, to uh, watch over fighters that may need some monitoring, um, and uh, and it's it's great to have athletic trainers on, on the sideline there. Uh, Nate on the left uh, picture, he was our athletic trainer uh, for that UFC event, and and he basically kept us all in check and and let us uh, you know made sure that all all our paperwork was together and and the fighters were going where they needed to go, and if uh, we needed to monitor somebody, he was watching them in the back. Uh, so there is a role uh, for athletic trainers in the combat sports setting. Uh, so if you want to get involved, um, probably the lowest hanging fruit is to uh, get in touch with the national governing bodies of the amateur sports, get in touch with USA Boxing. They are dying for help. Um, so I'm sure uh, you can find, find a place to uh, get involved. Um, Lower profile commissions, so your smaller states, you're gonna, you know, if you can get in touch with some of the commissioners, and and explain your your uh, your skill set and what you would like to do, I'm I'm sure lower level commissions would love to have you, and the um, supervising ringside physicians would love to have you as well. Um, having said that, if you're in the larger commissions, uh, your states like New York and California and Nevada, you're probably not going to get anywhere. Um, but your your smaller states, uh, you definitely uh, can probably gain more traction. Uh, the link here is to the Association of Boxing Commissions uh, website, and this is the contacts for all the various different commissions um, and who who you can get in contact with. Uh, other ways you can get involved is train, go to a gym, learn the sport, 
uh, find a gym where there's competing athletes. Maybe you can get in more, not just on a covering level of covering the event, maybe you can get in with a team. Uh, you know, uh, you can, you know, I think this is an area where, where there may be some growth as, especially in, in these uh, larger MMA camps uh, to where, where guys train together. Um, I will say this, uh, you know, one thing that could make you more marketable and be more accepted and, and, and potentially get further along here is uh, get your strength and conditioning, uh, strength training certification or, or some type of nutrition training. So not only can you help manage the injuries and, and, and things like that, but also you can help in the training aspect in getting the fighters uh, prepared for their um, fights during camp. Uh, join the Association of Ringside Physicians. We're not just physicians, we are their allied healthcare professionals. Um, you can visit our website. Uh, we have our national conference, uh, actually international conference, because we are not just a national organization, we have international membership as well. Um, and it will be in Las Vegas in 2022 in October. I know that's football season. So um, visit our website. We have lots of resources uh, that are available. And uh, and uh, we would love to have you be a part of it. Dr. Henny, are we taking any questions? I know we're uh, on if, time if here, but I- If you want to get in a, a couple here quickly, we, we sure. can start. Yeah, I, I, had, I did have one that popped up. And that one is coming from Daniel, and he's asking about, and I, I was just looking back through your um, presentation a little bit, he was asking about the, the different research studies that you had put in regarding the number of injuries of boxing versus MMA. Mm -hmm. and his question is, aren't there a lot more boxing matches taking place during that time span versus the number of MMA fights? Um, I don't have exact numbers for you, but I will tell you nowadays, especially over the last 10 years, at least in America, there are significantly more MMA fights than there are in box than there are in boxing. So I, I don't think, uh, I don't think the numbers are that far off, uh, recently. I get what he's saying. There's a higher volume of, of, of potential boxing, uh, and that's why you may have more deaths. But, um, you know, I, based on uh, my, my experience in talking with our ringside colleagues around the, around the country, there's more MMA going on. Do you find that in Florida? Are you doing more MMA or boxing? Or is it a little mixed bag, especially now with everything going on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a little mixed fight. bag. So, and, and it kind of depends on who my local promoters are. A lot of my local promoters are big boxing guys, but I know the Tallahassee guy really likes MMA. Mm. Uh, this past weekend, that one was an MMA event over in Daytona. So it, it, I, I find that it's kind of what, what is the promoter like and what is what, it, what do they want to organize? Yeah, yeah it's, I think the um, I think what you find actually in the bigger commission. So like so like. New York, like California, like Nevada, like Florida, um, like Texas, you probably have a 50-50 split, but in the smaller states, there's definitely more MMA happening. Oh, awesome. Perfect. <laughs> um, the, yes. And then, you know, at, at the ARP, another person I did meet, UFC has a, has, has hired an athletic trainer. So, yes, so yeah, that I, I had met an athlete trainer who's there um, as part of the UFC delegation. So the UFC has their Performance Institute, uh, which is basically their their training facility that they have. Uh, they have nutritionists on staff. They have physical therapists on staff, and anybody who is uh, under a UFC contract can utilize their facility out in Vegas. Now from talking with those guys there, about a third use it uh, like significantly, a third don't use it at all, and a third kind of use it sporadically, mostly during like fight week and stuff. Um, they're building more of these around the world. There's one in China now, and they're working on one in Brazil, I believe too. They're ahead of the curve though. Nobody else is doing what they're doing.
I'll give them one more minute to see when you ask questions. All right. Yep. And I, it's looking like we are good here. So we will go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much for presenting tonight. Very good information. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, technical difficulties, but we got through. Um, my, uh, please, please visit the Association of Ringside Physicians website. Uh, my contact info is on there. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to reach out to me, and I will uh, do my best to to answer your question. Well, I can definitely answer your ringside medicine questions. Um, if there's uh, if there's you need help in, in coordinating things and finding things. I do. We do have enough contacts and enough people around the country to where most of the time we can find a, find a recommendation for you. Yeah, awesome. And then and then I'll watch for you uh, whether or not whether or not you work your event in December. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Uh, right now I'm pro I'll be a I'll be I'm slated to work the first boxing event at Madison Square Garden during the. Uh, pandemic, he'll be on main big time ESPN, not ESPN Plus. Actually, he'll be on normal ESPN right after the Heisman presentation. So, awesome, awesome. Well, I'll keep my eyes out. <laughs> All right, sounds good. All right, have a good night. All right, take care.